So you've been a scholar of how information uh, technology is changing government. You, uh, we're talking here about learning and the context of uh, Government 2.0, the importance of incorporating uh, better education that really supplies both government and private industry with workers who right. are, are able to move in this very fluid environment. Um, what are some of the, the challenges and opportunities uh, for government and citizens in the information age? Well, I think the first thing to do is step back and recognize that in the uh, maybe 1980 period, many of us thought that information technology was going to be the holy grail that opened up the ability to bring tremendous efficiency to corporations, to the industry. Uh, and it did have a very positive effect on there. But the surprising thing to me is that soon it became obvious by the turn of the century uh, that at least I personally started thinking that IT was the biggest handicap toward innovation because IT systems were written 20, 30 years ago. The code was totally in, impenetrable and it kind of caused us to get locked into a way of doing things. And so it really prevented us from inventing radically new business models and new ways to interact with customers. Uh, to get customers to co-produce things with us and so on and so forth. We did some interesting things on the surface, but the fundamentals, the ERP systems that ran our corporations basically stayed fixed. They couldn't be changed. So all innovation that happened, well, at least almost all, happened on the edge of the companies um, because that's where you could put some simple web-facing services out there. Often your CIO didn't even know about them. Yeah. Uh, and like at EGM, uh, I don't think the CIO ever knew about that. Uh, that turned out to be one of the most successful new businesses that the GM ever created. Okay, now, so suddenly IT has gone from being the savior to being almost a conceptual block barrier yeah. uh, to doing things in a new way. Now, the government is that problem magnified because basically the government runs on ERP systems that are probably 40 years old, not 20 years old. Okay? Okay. Um, and so there's a certain way of doing things, and that certain way of doing things got coded up as, as business practices for the government as well, business processes, practices, um, and got welded into these systems uh, that really defined how government ran. Um, and nobody cared about changing that. They didn't care about making it kind of be slightly more efficient in terms of these fixed processes. Um, and these fixed processes were basically a push model. They basically said, we in the center will decide, and we will push stuff out, and then we'll give you a very narrow pipe on the outside to funnel back information. Okay, and you have to fill out these forms to f bring in information and so on and so forth. Now with this whole government 2.0 idea, the idea is to blow this entire paradigm up and to say, no, what about if government were a, a platform? And a platform, and I still think Tim's beautiful idea is think about a platform in terms of the iPhone, iPad. Okay. You know, how might it really be possible that a small number of apps get designed by the center, in this case, Steve Jobs, as you were talking about, mm -hmm. uh, maybe 20? Uh, and you put those out and they actually prime the imagination to start to think brand new thoughts about what could actually be done. And now, uh, what, a year later, you have, according to Tim, 200,000, my record is 145,000 new apps that have been created by everybody out there, mm -hmm. not orchestrated, but serving perceived needs and bringing the users much more close to the platform in terms of creation, of, if not co-creation. Uh, and so the idea is, these same ideas in terms of the government is taking the government as a platform, how could we reverse this whole thing so we actually get the citizens to do more of the work for us in terms of what needs to be happening, more eyes on the street, so to speak, um, and then let there be uh, an incredible host of, of apps on these platforms that let uh, citizens start to participate in a brand new way uh, with government, being able to not only look at what the government is doing in terms of the transparency movement, which is pretty clear, uh, complicated but clear, uh, to now saying, what would it mean to do it differently? Or maybe the government should create like these challenge grants that have just been announced. You know, how do we pull the ideas from Innocentive 
uh, in the corporate world to say, let's look at the fact that most of the bright people are up not to be in the government or in any one company. How do we start to tap the collective wisdom of the people outside toward even attacking fundamental problems inside, such as, for example, um, the miners that are trapped in the Chilean mine or the BP oil spill? Um, you know, why couldn't there have been 10,000 people contributing ideas to that? Um, now, that's an adolescent idea to say, well, maybe it just it takes the right set of ideas flowing in because you know, there is deep science underlying what went wrong down there at the mm -hmm. bottom of the ocean. Uh, so it may not be the best example, but it turns out that a better example than first people thought because that was done. Well, from what I understand, um, the science of what went wrong isn't as complex as the science of uh, what it needed to actually happen to fix it. And they're still trying to trace back the line of who actually made the valve that finally fixed it, but it appears that it may have been submitted as one of the thousands of ideas that came in. Uh, and I haven't seen any really good reporting yet that tracked back yes. the design, but you can, you can, you you can, can see, see it's it coming. And uh, hmm. uh, the deeper science actually is absolutely right, uh, not just the fixing of the valve, but you know, Steve too had uh, Department of Energy some hmm. fairly clever ideas about doing something that was kind of a, a pretty risky experiment. You had to get those calculations right. You had to figure out if those ideas went wrong, what you would do about it, and mm. so on and so forth. That's something you want the best of the best to be thinking through, because the cost of something going wrong in one of these types of experiments uh, could be astronomical. Uh, but you know, the point is, we got to kind of bring, we got to open up a new discourse. Mm -hmm. where, uh, where there's honest God conversation. People aren't just on sound bites. Yeah. Is that possible in today's media climate with uh, the relationship that people have with government, the uh, pervasive distrust or anger that you can see out in the electorate to have that kind of, of yeah, change? Yeah, it's a great question because, you know, I, I sit there and I, uh, I, I listen to this anger, which is real, palatable, um, and I keep thinking to myself, yeah, you know, government, and I'm not a Tea Party person, uh, believe me, but, you know, uh, government is getting way too huge for, for its own good. Um, and so it's not a question of small versus big government. It's a question of smart government and smart people interacting in smart ways with a smart government, building a smart discourse and smart dialogues in terms of tapping the collective wisdoms of both internal and external. And so, again, just going back to the, why I started about those business models, is corporations were built with, I will forecast the needs, scale to the extreme in order to get efficiency, and then push and sell those ideas to you. Well, government basically the same. Uh, so one of the things that you can see in smarter organizations is their ability to adapt and iterate very quickly, right. you know, to, to fall forward quickly, to be agile. I mean, it's right. an agile development model. Um, how can government become more of a learning organization where uh, you get rapidly speed up the development cycle? Is it possible even for agencies to become that way? You know, that's both a political question, a social question, and a technical question. The easy part is the technical question, as, as usual. Uh, technically speaking, this is where the cloud is revolutionizing things. Because now I don't have to first secure another 1,000 processors or 10,000 processors to do something. I can actually grab for a short moment of time, you know, as many processors as I want on the Amazon cloud for example, and try out an idea. Um, so I don't have to go through one year of procurement to do something. I, I can afford to be wrong. Mm -hmm. I can afford to say, oops, that didn't work. Shut those machines down. You know, and I just pay for the use so there's no long-term cost there and so on and so forth. So the ability to start to experiment with new ideas goes radically up, uh, and the cost of failure goes radically down. That is a damn good beginning to this game. Um, now, the second part of it is, is a little bit more political or institutional. Let's talk about institutional. Um, basically, if the cost of failure is minimized, which is what the cloud computing paradigm is allowing us to have, then we have the sense of saying, like, yeah, let me put it up to learning. And so suddenly you find the discourse shifting from failure to what did I learn? And assuming you have institutional leaders that see these is the way, because we learn through errors. 
Um, now we're going to amplify our ability to learn and get smarter insight. So there's a new narrative, but that narrative is, is A, correct, uh, it's not bullshit, uh, and B, it's, um, it, it's the way to accelerate learning. Um, politically, you know, the funny thing is, is the, the, narr the grand narrative of let's see how smart we can good, do, how smart we can be, you know, how much we can get done by being small um, is actually, uh, and small through this notion of platform. So uh, going back to Steve Jobs, you know, a small number of apps, 145,000 apps now, it would have taken an army of people to produce those apps under the kind of centralized mm -hmm. scheme. Okay, so the, the hope here is that politically, this could be a brand new narrative. And it is one of the first, it may be the only narrative I've heard that is truly bipartisan. Because it doesn't say one thing about big versus, you know, uh, small, et cetera, et cetera. It really says, bring the people in, tap the collective wisdom, provide the power tools, provide new ways to listen and new ways to be heard. Um, but heard through action, not through political statements. So we'll see what the challenge grants do. Yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, because that's going to be action. So, so we've depoliticized kind of the, perhaps the most important place there is in terms of reinventing government. And so uh, to me, um, you know, this is, this is the one piece of optimism I see unfolding before us. Um, and it has the technological power that we couldn't have done two years ago. The notion of platforms is now really understood. How to architect these things is better understood. The ability for everybody to participate in these platforms is now pretty simple because basically, you know, all it takes is a cell phone. Uh, so, you know, we, we have truly democratized the ability to participate uh, this way. Um, and now we need imagination. And I think, um, you know, and, and a clear way to build what I'm going to call the narrative and the grand narrative. And I think if the, those two can get lined up with each other, then we can be off and running. Because I really do not, I really do think this is, you know, the one bipartisan idea yeah. that should actually sell in this town of yours. <laughs> so well, you live here. Yeah, I, I do live here, but I don't claim any ownership. <laughs> oh, okay, but yeah, this wonderful town. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, uh, big questions for the year ahead. And uh, thank you for taking a couple swings at, uh, well, I wouldn't say answering them, but at least framing them in a way that lays out the context. And I think actually framing them is more important than answering them. Because hmm. I think that we don't know the answers and we'll get some of those answers wrong, but the framing helps you think through what questions to be asked. And, you know, my title in some funny sense is I'm now having moved from chief scientist to Xerox to chief of confusion. Mm -hmm. It comes from the idea of saying much more power is, comes from asking the right question than just coming up with an answer. Uh, that's the kind of insight we can end on. Okay. Thank you, sir. That was the idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>